Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Scouting for Growth, where we uncover the stories behind the most inspirational entrepreneurs, investors, and industry leaders who have transformed their ideas into incredible success stories. I am thrilled to introduce you today to my guest, someone whose unique entrepreneurial journey embodies the essence of growth and innovation. Sarah St. John is not just ordinary entrepreneur, an author, a podcaster, and a world traveler with an affinity for all living creatures. Sarah has built an extraordinary career from an early age. She explains to me that she was not really keen to work for the corporates or uh, to be part of the corporate life. Her name has become synonymous with frugal entrepreneurship, a testament to her prowess in launching and managing successful startups on a budget. As a brain behind several startups, Saha has used her experience to pen books, run a blog, and most notably, host the well-regarded podcast, The Frugalpreneur, through these mediums, She's been inspiring and equipping individuals with the knowledge and tools to kickstart and maintain their online business, even under tight financial constraints. Sarah's journey serves as an exemplar of how one can navigate through the volatile worlds of startups, leveraging current market trends and mitigating challenges that, you know, often happen with challenging market circumstances without actually exhausting one's resources. Her entrepreneurial spirit combined with a keen understanding of market dynamics offers a wealth of insights for those who are on the path to business growth. So without further ado, let's dive into the conversation. Let's welcome Sarah St. Jones, to Scouting for Growth. Hi, Sarah. Thank you very much for joining me on Scouting for Growth. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So I want to start about understanding who you are, Sarah, and what you do every day. And what inspired you to become an entrepreneur yourself? at such an early age as well. Yeah. So, I mean, my entrepreneurship journey started, I would say 2008. Um, I had had six different jobs that year, not at the same time, but throughout the course of the year and realized that working for other people just wasn't my thing. And so I decided to start a business. Um, My first business was a photography business doing weddings and portraits uh, but discovered that it was it was expensive to maintain equipment and software and driving here and there to these events and stuff. And so I decided to try an online business model, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I tried several different things like blogging, drop shipping, affiliate marketing, print on demand. Um, and it was through trying all these different business models that I decided to write a book called Frugalpreneur. And it was about the different types of ways to make money online and how to do it on a budget. So then I launched a podcast also called Frugalpreneur to kind of help promote that book. But I got more leverage and traction with the podcast than the book. Love the networking and connections I was making. So it was originally only going to be a few episodes, but I, I've kept it going for like four years now. Started a podcast production agency and help people with like podcast coaching and education and stuff like that. And so I'm basically all in on podcasting now, but it took over 10 years to try this, that, and the other thing to get to that point. <laughs> That's super cool because, you know, we, you know, we have the frugalpreneur 
uh, um, podcast and so it's interesting you're coming into scouting for growth to talk about it as well and what I think it's very important as well is understanding from you what it takes to build a great podcast Mm. yeah so I think one misconception that people have is that it that it's expensive because they're thinking in terms of like a broadcast studio like at a radio station or a record label or something um but really you can start with like i mean i started with a a mic i still have it an atr 2100 which i don't think they make anymore there's one called a samsung q2u which is basically the same thing and it i want to say it was like 60 maybe 80 bucks a USB mic that plugs right into your computer. And I mean, aside from that, I mean, you could record in Zoom like we're doing and there's and that's free. And then there's other platforms as well. Um, and then you just need a podcast host to host your files and then they distribute it to Apple and Spotify and all of that. Um, and that can be as little as five to twenty dollars a month depending on who you go with so it's actually really affordable to get started and I've found that it's really the for me the best way to you know get more exposure people find you um you know and even being a guest on other podcasts i think is important whether you have your own podcast or not definitely guest on other podcasts uh because then you're basically leveraging their audience getting access to their audience maybe they'll come check out your podcast or become a client or a customer um i just think in this day and age having a podcast for your business or at least guesting on podcasts um is almost like i wouldn't say mandatory but it's it's important I agree. I mean, for me, podcasting is one of the channels to market. And I was fortunate, actually, uh, Saha, to during COVID, actually, to get acquainted um, to the world, you know, of the best, you know, the Gary V's and um, the Grand Cardone and um, the, you know, the, the group. And I think all of them know each other. And so... One of them reached out, said, you know, why don't you come on to my course around podcasting, which I did, was very affordable. And uh, one thing I didn't realize at the time is there were probably 1.2 million podcasts in the United States and only 250,000 podcasts in the UK. And that was two years ago. Oh, wow. And he explains that podcasting right now is the place you want to be because that is what people do every day, right? We listen to podcasts. We can listen to podcasts while we are going to work, on the train, in the car, while we are driving. We can actually do it whilst we are running, much more so than going on YouTube, watching a video. Mm -hmm. And so if one has a decent voice, it could be, you know, a very great way to communicate with an audience and also talk about things which affect everybody in this world and actually provide amazing education and takeaways. And as I learned um, about that, I also realized that actually I wanted to talk about something which was important for me, which was about growth. But taking me back to, to you, Saha, what were the most significant challenges you face while establishing yourself, you know, from your first startups to actually defining that podcasting was a source of growth for you and enabling others to be successful at doing it as well, because I've seen you're enabling others as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think networking really, um, you know, having someone as a guest on your show or being a guest on someone else's show and like kind of maintaining that relationship, at least virtually maybe meeting them in person at an event um, and kind of forming a friendship and then, and maybe even a collaboration and just so many opportunities. Like, I think there's the, you know, having listeners turn into clients and customers, obviously, and then also like forming these relationships with other podcasters or other guests. Um, I think that's, that's, it it almost becomes, it's a slow growth initially, like um organic right like 
great work usually tend to be organic because people need to find you and they need to like you. Uh, I think. Yeah. Like for example, just la- was it last week? Um, yeah. My podcast actually charted in the top like 200, but it was like 120 something in the entrepreneurship space and uh, in the U S and so I've been podcasting for four years, seeing like, you know, gradual growth. But then all of a sudden I, and I, I found out about it because I noticed that my analytics, uh, that my numbers were drastically increasing kind of out of nowhere. And so I talked to a few podcast friends about it. I'm like, I don't know what's happening. And they actually went and looked and they're like, you're in the top. 200 and then like that day it just kept going and I guess um what actually happened was because I was featured in essentials um on Apple and so anyway I think my point is I guess is that it took four years basically I'm just now seeing like major growth all of a sudden um and so it kind of can feel like it happens overnight but yet it still took four years (laughs) Well, you know, four years in a startup life, you know, unicorns usually take far four to seven years to to become unicorns. Great, great startup, right? I mean, I know there are many startups. So four years is maybe years. So you should not be worried about that. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So- no, I, I'm I'm not. I just know that a lot of people when they start their podcast, they just assume that it's gonna take off right away. And if you're like a celebrity already, then yeah, I probably will. <laughs> But otherwise, if you're just a regular person, it's going to take a while. <laughs> I agree. And that is one thing when I, I was talking to those experts that, you know, people go and decide to do podcasting. They don't always know why they are doing it. And then the experts, they expect to be charting in top 50. And no, it's not the way it works. Um, you have to put sweat, you have to put effort and you have to put time into doing it. However, if it is actually used properly, it can lead to a great relationship, as you said. Um, some of the people I've got on my podcast are absolutely amazing people. Some are, you know, really good friends as well because we are very much into the same industry. But I wanted to branch out. And so I've talked to people from all around the globe. And um, I met some amazing entrepreneur, you know, serial exit entrepreneurs and, and people who are really wanting to give uh, life to entrepreneurship, even to investment. And we communicate, as you said, all the time. So that is the first step. You know, you actually build new friends. But the powerful of podcasting is, a source for people to educate themselves, but also potentially, as you said, finding your next customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes that customer could be a listener or it could be a guest that was on your show. Or if you're a guest on other shows, it could be the host. I mean, there's just so many different angles. (laughs) Indeed. So let's talk about Frugalpreneur. You said you studied the book and then you have a podcast. Tell us about what it is about, because I know it's about entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. It's about providing mm-hmm. advice. Tell us a little bit more around the thesis about it and how you use actually your different channels to provide this education to entrepreneurs. Yeah. So basically the tagline is building a business on a bootstrap budget. So it's about entrepreneurship, but for people typically online, people who are you know, course creators, coaches, consultants, uh, you know, anything that you can do online basically versus like a brick and mortar or retail, because that's hard to do on a budget (laughs) or a tight budget. Um, And so basically like any kind of online creator and, and how to run that online business on a bootstrap budget to where you don't have to get loans and credit and investors and all of this kind of thing um you just kind of keep putting back into the business whatever you know a portion of what you're actually making um so that's what it's about i inter i do have some solo episodes on a particular topic or like a software program i recommend they're mostly interviews though with other entrepreneurs um some you know starting with a hundred bucks or maybe a thousand bucks uh, and then bootstrapping all the way up to seven figures. 
Um, so stories like that are a lot of the episodes as well. That's super cool. And so as an author and a podcaster, as you said, what were probably some of the most significant stories you were able to enjoy and uh, convey to your audience? So there's one in particular, and this episode has actually gotten the most downloads, last I checked, out of any of my episodes. And it was an interview with someone, you know, that isn't, his name is Yui, U-Y-I, Abraham. Um, he's originally from somewhere in Africa and he came, so he shared his story. He came to America with only a hundred dollars mm -hmm. and he bootstrapped. So basically he started with a hundred dollars and started some business. I can't remember what it was, but then when he got 2000 from that business, then he invested in a camera and started doing photography. Then after he made however much after that from that business, then he did the next thing. So he kind of, it was almost like a step ladder. And now he has like three software companies that are in the seven and eight figure range, but all bootstrapped. Um, so I think that episode was titled like a hundred dollars from a hundred dollars to seven figures or something like that. Um, so yeah, I think that was one of, one of my favorite stories. Yeah. And no, it sounds like a very inspirational story as well, right? Yeah, it really is. And talking about software, Saha, I want to ask you about the technology, right? We often hear about AI, Jira AI now. You know, all of us have played with it, digital transformation. You know, how does it play within your world into educating and enabling, you know, from, from those coming and talking to you? Uh, enabling others to understand why we need to be digital, why we need to understand artificial intelligence, why we need to actually do it responsibly as well, um, but be part of that transformation because everything you do is digital, right? No brick and mortar. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I recommend that everyone obviously have a website. <laughs> um, some people think that just having like a social media, like a Facebook page is enough. Um, and I do recommend having social media, but to not rely just on that, you need your own because you never know what could happen with social media. You could lose access. It could go away. Like you just don't know. Um, so definitely having a website and then um, an email service provider. I use SendFox, which is actually free up to a certain number of subscribers. And then I think after that, it's just a one-time payment of $49 versus that's another thing. I recommend things that are like a one-time purchase, which AppSumo, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that has, yeah, tons of software deal, deals. And, and SendFox is actually one of their products, but um, what I like about SendFox, aside from the fact that it's very affordable, <laughs> is that if you're like a podcaster, a blogger, or a YouTuber, you can link up your RSS feed or like your YouTube channel. And anytime there's a new podcast episode, blog post, YouTube video, whatever, it'll automatically create a newsletter and send it out to your email list. So I just love that because it's kind of hands off. Um, and then like for, well, now for websites and sales funnels and, uh, all of that kind of stuff, I use something called system.io it's, it's system with an E at the end.io. It's kind of like click funnels, but a much more affordable option. They have a free plan and then, um, goes from there, but, uh, you know, one thing I recommend when starting out when it comes to software is try to go the free route as long as you can, and then only, you know, do the paid as you need to, like if you need to upgrade, because, you know, now you have over however many email subscribers, now you have to upgrade, or go to AppSumo, where you can just pay like a one-time fee for various softwares and use those. Um, and then like with AI, um, there's so many AI tools and for so many different things. One that I've been using for podcasting, like, a, so after I do an episode and I edit it, well, first of all, I use Descript to edit um, 
which I love Descript. And then after that, I take that file and put it into something called Cast Magic, which was an AppSumo deal. So I got a lifetime deal. And that'll automatically create show notes, um, guest bios, discussion questions, tweets, threads, Instagram, re- like all kinds of stuff uh, with a click of a button. <laughs> And so that's that's a big time saver as well. Um, I know, so, but I don't. Even, I didn't know even about that so much. So I'm learning. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's so many tools out there that can just make, and they're affordable, and they can make the process yeah. a lot easier and less time consuming these days. But one thing which is interesting around what, what you are talking about is about, you know, the point of front frugula, frugularity, you know, being frugal. And in current market circumstances where, you know, we are in a highly uncertain uh, market environment, um, we don't know whether there's inflation yesterday or tomorrow or whether there's going to be still interest rate increase or, uh, you know, decrease it means that people are making choices to actually create certainty and resiliency around their lives. And so being frugal is actually pretty safe, right? It's better to manage your dollars better than trying to spend them in erratical ways. And so when you look at the entrepreneurs out there, what did they learn from you from learning to be frugal, from learning to find AppSumo, for instance, for technology, from building a budget. Um, what did they learn from you to do that more effectively? Yeah, so, I mean, I have the podcast, which has a few different episodes on things like that. And of course, the book as well. Um, but yeah, I would say like shiny object syndrome is a big problem that a lot of entrepreneurs have. And whether that's like you have a million different business ideas and you start them and then you're like, oh, this other idea sounds good. So I'm going to start that now that, I mean, that just uh, takes up a lot of time. <laughs> and and then like, if you have 10 things going, then you can only designate 10% of your time and money to each of those things instead of a hundred percent to one thing. Um, but then shiny object syndrome too, as far as like new gadgets and tools and mics for example for podcasters like mics and cameras and whatever but like so I guess one tip would be to try to recognize when you have shiny object syndrome and like reel it in get it under control and then uh you know again also try to use free tools or like an all-in-one type platform where like system.io there's also click slow the c-l-i-x-l-o that's kind of a new one out like these things where it only costs like a certain amount per month whether it's 27 dollars or 97 dollars a month and but it it everything you need is there websites funnels uh emails scheduling calendar whatever um, and then that's a good way to kind of condense everything. So you're not paying, you know, 10 bucks here and 20 bucks there and 50 bucks here. Um, so yeah, that's what I would recommend. Yeah. Yeah. It is true. I mean, the, the key thing is technology and, you know, I work with startups and, you know, I have my own database. So within it is probably 2.5 million startups. I, my team monitors um, every week, but we work with corporations and help them identify how they can improve their own business models by tapping in that technology asset. And there are a lot of technologies out there. And as you said, I even am passionate about generative AI right now because I'm so intrigued by it. And I have spent a lot of money trying tools. I mean, I will tell you, I'm not even going to tell you that I'm there because it's bad. <laughs> But, you know, you have to pay to actually try it and then you cancel the subscription. But I think now we have definitely a good view of what works and what doesn't work. And some of the platforms we've tried, we have to to tell them what you are selling is pure lipstick on the pet. It's not working. And they don't like me saying that to them. So I may actually write about it in an article and they hate it even more. But 
the article is coming and I would probably focus on the things that works. So <laughs> what's you, your view as to looking at current days, right? What are the good budget techniques people can actually use? I was reading this great article around, you know, as you said, look at the tools, play with them, try them, right? Um, least as a startup, what you are prepared to spend on what, you know, what is your budget? How, how far you are going to go? You know, your fixed costs, your valuable, valuable costs, your monthly revenue, how much you're expecting to, to generate. And actually you have to work backward because you need to pay yourself as well. So what are the type of tools, techniques, advice you give the entrepreneurs which are approaching you, who are approaching you every day? Yeah. So as far as determining your budget, I mean, I guess that would be individualized to the person. My budget, I try to stay, and I usually do, um, under $100 a month, like for all my software and stuff. Now, it might go over a little more if I'm like running an ad, which again, even then I try not to spend more than $100 a month on an ad if I'm going to run one. But as far as like software and like just the basic maintenance of an online business, I stick to under 100. So that's mine. But of course, you know, everybody has their own amount. <laughs> um, and then, of course, as you make more, you can increase, you can put some of that back into the business or increase your monthly um, budget. And, you know, keep a spreadsheet of like expenses and and see where you can maybe cut some you know like i said like some people might have subscriptions to five or ten different things that cost anywhere from 10 to 50 or maybe 100 a month but if you can find something that kind of incorporates a lot of those things into one software not only is it uh, more affordable usually it's also just easier to manage to have like one platform to deal with than 10 um <laughs> so yeah and then you yeah forget them, right you forget them you buy all those uh, those software and uh you don't even actually remember you have them and then one day you look at your credit card bill and it's like oh i still have that and then you realize you have to to get rid of it i mean i'm not the type of person buying monthly subscription because i do not like having to remember every month to actually put it into the accounting software. Um, I'd rather say, okay, let's just buy it for the, the year. And then I would say, you forget it. You don't forget mm -hmm. it. You have to use it. But it means you manage your time better or your accountant time or your finance time better. better. Can I ask you, so therefore, you know, looking at all those techniques, right, around how you manage a business on, on the budget and actually how you make the best use of every single dollars you use. When you look at the marketing approach, how do you market yourself and how they get, can you get the most of your marketing dollars? As you said, you actually sometimes do paid marketing, mm -hmm. um, but you don't need to, right? You sometimes mm -hmm. also use your ecosystem. What do you see the most effective marketing strategy as a result of frugality? Yeah, definitely, you know, the word of mouth, the networking, that's, you know, first of all, it's free and that's the the best route to take or even like offering to have an affiliate or a referral program. So like if someone refers you that it gives them motivation to refer you because then they get a cut of that. Um, but besides that, as far as actually, you know, paying for advertising and things, at least from a podcaster perspective, I found that advertising directly in podcast player apps versus say Facebook, um, does way better because they're already in the app and then your ad, there's different ways to do it in different platforms, but like it might be a display ad where it shows your podcast cover art, for example, while they're listening to another podcast or at the top, or it might be, you could set it up to where you record like a little 30 second audio clip and have that inserted into other podcasts um so the click-through rate on those is just much higher people are more likely to go check out your podcast maybe even subscribe and download a few episodes um if they're already in a podcast app but like 
you could run ads on Facebook, but the challenge is getting people off of Facebook into a podcast app, especially if they don't even have a podcast app or don't listen to podcasts. And there's not, it's just a lot more difficult. Like it might be worth trying just to test it out with a small budget, but I would say to go, if you're a podcaster anyway, to, to market and podcast um, players. Now, if you're not a podcaster, um, I mean, it, it really kind of depends on what your business is as to where to advertise, like whether it's a Google search engine. So like Google ads, I would say localized businesses. Although if you're an online business, it's not likely to be necessarily localized but you know google then would make sense um Mm -hmm. but yeah there's there's so many options out there and it's kind of a test like trial and test different options (laughs) yeah you know i feel so I mean, so, so happy that the podcast, my podcast is going fine. You know, I'm around 80,000 downloads in 18 months, so I can't complain. Um, However, interesting enough, I didn't know those tips around Mm. the podcast channels and all those things. So Mm. I'm going to try them, Saha, because I tend to use my social media. So I I use LinkedIn. It's all about business and my target audience, as you probably know, include entrepreneurs, uh, but it's also it's also about the uh, intrapreneurs, people in cooperation, who actually would find that interesting that you can actually manage a business in such a low bu- budget. And the reason why it's interesting is, you know, cooperation have a lot of waste, a lot of money. And um, when they actually work with startups, they realize that some of the work can actually be done in a such a lean, much more focused and a such a smaller budget manner and so that's why i love creating that synergy between corporations and and startup but also the investors actually um so which who i'm sure i will be actually very surprised that you could build a business in a thousand two hundred dollars a year uh they will they will feel like the the brain will say that it's not working it's not working it's not coming it's like solo preneur okay but imagine if you could manage your investment money all a bit better. I think everybody could get a lot more value from it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What would be the takeaways, you know, or other things or tips you would want, you know, the listeners to remember around building business, solo business, frugal business to actually, actually, I think maintain and be resilient in in times of needs right where you don't even know where you will be next year Mm -hmm. what would be uh, takeaways yeah i mean one would be the avoiding the shiny object syndrome because that can be a big distraction and can end up being expensive um another one would be you know patience you can't expect for a business or a podcast or whatever it is to just take off immediately um so definitely i you know find one thing stick with it and maybe give it at least a year and of course if you really just don't like it then that's a different story but just don't get frustrated that it's taking a while um yeah yeah, especially like a lot of people will start these jobs or these you know, businesses while they're working a job, uh, a nine to five. So it's more of a side hustle initially. And so the pressure to, for it to, to make, you know, your salary, what you're used to isn't as high. Um, And yeah, I mean, there's just, I I think figuring out what area you want to go into, and also, like, what are you good at? What is something that people have told you you're good at? And mm. and go that route. See what you, how can you monetize that thing that you're good at? Like, say you're really, this is totally random, but say you're really good at fishing. I don't know. Yes. And, um, like, maybe you could create a course or something about how to, you know, maybe you're, like, somehow able to catch fish all the time and most people can't. I'm just making this up. Um, you know, you could create a course or something. Like there's a way to monetize probably really anything that 
someone is an expert in. Yes. So, Sarah, so thank you so much for the insight. If uh, our listeners want to find you, where should they go? Yeah, so you can check out my podcast, Frugalpreneur, at frugal.show. Uh, I also have some free ebooks there as well at frugal.show forward slash free. That's super cool. So then we can actually get all your tips. I'm going to dive into those because I'm sure I can make a lot of savings, I realize. So, so thank you very much for helping me out. What <laughs> would be your last words of wisdom for our listeners as well? Um, I guess I would say, you know, don't just keep procrastinating. If you have an idea, just go for it. Um, don't because done is better than perfect as the saying goes or start ugly or whatever um start with your you ugly know, babies <laughs> yeah or mvp minimum viable product whatever it is that you're creating or starting like you don't have to wait till you have everything figured out or until you have the 100 bucks saved up or however much or until you know, you have all your ducks in a row or whatever, just start and, and see where it goes. <laughs> yeah. I think we are in the world where, you know, being trialist, I would say trialist, you know, trying new things is so important today. I do believe that what we've learned over the past three years is that we need to build resiliency around everything we do to actually create certainty Mm -hmm. And um, gig, you know, being a gig or, you know, we talk about digital nomadist, but at the end of the day, gig work, so creator work is going to increase because, you know, whether you're working for a corporation or you have a small business, having side hustle is actually quite fun because you're actually learning new skills. And I think people are doing this because they want to learn new skills. I remember talking to a CEO of one of the biggest Fortune 500 uh, company, you know, many months ago. Um, saying, you know, my, me as a creator, I paint. And he was painting digitally as well. As best, mm -hmm. he was a, an amazing painter. He mm -hmm. was learning to be a digital painter as well. And oh, wow. he started selling those paintings digitally as well. So even big company CEOs are looking for new ways to entertain themselves, right? To actually where value exchange is created. It's about all mm -hmm. that value exchange. So, uh -huh. Thank you very much for joining me on Scouting for Growth. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Until next time. If you like this podcast, subscribe now, share with your friends, and if you enjoyed it, please give it a five-star review. Also, if you want to cover any specific subject with me, contact me on Instagram under Sabine VDL Officials or LinkedIn under Sabine Van der Linden. Thank you.